Hello and welcome to today's Marketing Sherpa webinar. Today we're going to be talking about content marketing and McGladry's 300% increase in production. Thank you for joining us today. I am Daniel Burstein, the Director of Editorial Content here at Mech Labs. I'm in our corporate headquarters in Jacksonville Beach, Florida in our studio. Joining me today from Charlotte, North Carolina is Eric Webb, the Senior Marketing Director, Corporate Marketing and Brand at McGladry. Thanks for joining us, Eric. Glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm going to be talking much more about Eric in just a moment, but let me tell you a bit about Marketing Sherpa webinars. What we do is we take a high-performing marketer like Eric, we sit him down here, get a lot of questions from you, the audience, and then we just fire them at Eric. And I got to say, we got a lot of questions about this topic, seven pages worth of questions to be exact. And Eric actually went through and filled out answers for each and every one of them. So he's got a lot of great things to talk about today. But if you have any more questions, feel free to use hashtag Sherpa webinar. You can use that to ask questions. You can also use that to share your own tips about content marketing and reach out to other marketers network, see what they're doing with content marketing. Uh, during this call, I'm just gonna put this up briefly. I'm gonna tweet through a few more resources about Eric's case study through hashtag Sherpa webinar. Um, but first, uh, let's, let's dive right into it, Eric. So some of the questions we got were around the results you achieved from this. So specifically, Erna wanted to know, um, can we see some specific statistics and numbers around web visits per month for example, how many unique visits there were per month before implementation of the strategy, how the content was spread, and how that affected unique visit numbers. So she's a webmaster. She's very interested in those specific web, web numbers, but why don't you give us a high level of your results, Eric? Yeah, there's no doubt. When we first started to look at our web visits, we were averaging right around 50,000, as it shows there up on the screen, 50,000 unique visitors. That doesn't, doesn't include employees. And when we went on the work effort to start producing more content, more high value content. We saw after that year that we were hitting around 100,000 visitors. And since then, right, going into uh, year two, we have started to hit up above that, so sometimes hitting as high as 130,000 or above, depending on the content and the news around it. So if we're very timely with certain tax alerts, or assurance issues, then that clearly pushes those numbers up much higher. And other things we've done to measure to see how relevant our content is, is we've moved outside of our own website. So we try to syndicate that content through other social channels, and we leverage either uh, Omniture Analytics uh, coding for that, or we'll use just simple bit.ly you know, URL shortener device uh, to measure the unique click-throughs from where we make those placements. So as you can see up on the screen, we have 9,000 form fills just from probably six to seven pieces of content in which we were syndicating content out very specifically for some groups that um, we work with. Now, those are some great results, but we got deeper questions too because marketers were clearly interested in results around content marketing. Um, beyond some of those maybe intermediate metrics, people want to know about the money. So, for, for example, uh, Norma, who's a marketing director, want to know how much new business from existing clients or prospects resulted from the increase in web visits. And Lloyd, a communications coordinator, wanted to know, I see that web visits have increased 100%. How has that translated into sales and profits? It's, it's interesting because we actually did a model uh, a couple years ago with our ad agency and, and the funnel works for us. I mean, more people we draw in, eventually they fall out at the bottom end for consideration. They consider us more. So the, the ultimate goal, though, was just visitors in the beginning. Since then, we've implemented some different measurement criteria. We use a CRM system and we use a marketing automation system all tied in together and it's also tied into our website analytics. So we're starting now this, this year uh, actually getting attributed revenue. So those, those uh, opportunities that come to us, we can actually link if they were the first thing they ever clicked on uh, for us was it some content we developed. And that was the first introduction to McGladry, at least that we can see in any measurable way. And we also measure influenced revenue. So we see if a particular campaign or piece of content has uh, a lot of people, a lot of opportunities surrounding it. And that's, we call that influenced revenue. And uh, we've seen some great results. Our consulting group as well 
uh, measured very directly a lot of the social syndication to the web forms through our CRM system, and they attributed just in uh, a particular six-month period $400,000 being attributed to content and the campaign surrounding that content. We've also attributed another $2 million to a particular survey campaign, what we call our, our McGladry Monitor, which is a, a survey to manufacturers in, in the middle market. So let's talk about that influence revenue for a moment because that point is really key. A lot of marketers struggle with content marketing not knowing the results content marketing produces because they'll just look at did the content lead to a final conversion, right? So perhaps a direct uh, uh, click from a blog, po blog post to a purchase or a form fill. But what you're saying is you're looking at kind of the big picture of the entire funnel of how content might affect the decision maybe earlier in the funnel before it gets to, to the final conversion. Is, is that correct? That's right, and I did that. You know, I come out of the direct marketing industry, and at the end of the day, my, my job as a marketer is to open up that door and begin the relationship. Uh, a, a piece of content doesn't, is never going to close a deal for us. It, you know, we're talking audit and tax and consulting issues here, so it, it's a face-to-face -face that ultimately closes the deal. So we take a look at what is the first... Uh, effort, first campaign that causes that person to want to engage with us and we give that attribution because it's the first thing that opened that door. And then we look at influence for out of all the campaigns, which campaigns seem to be associated to showing up a lot beyond just the first click through. So, because so, a campaign or a, a piece of content, an offer, as we know, you know, nothing's linear anymore. People come in and out as they engage with you. They may come in, do some discovery with you, leave, come back. And so the, that, the idea of measuring influence that multiple opportunities seem to show up against certain or aligned to certain content over and over. So that content seems to be very popular. We give that an influence ranking so that it, so you don't just discount that because clearly the content we produce should be influencing more engagement throughout the buy cycle of that uh, individual. Excellent. So now that we talked about kind of the big reward at the end, the results, let's talk about the hard work that went into it so other marketers can replicate your efforts. and. Really, this case study, to me, started way back before you even joined McGladry. I mean, all the experience a marketer has, they bring to their next company, and, and it affects it. And I remember Eric and I, we met at B2B Summit in Orlando, and we had dinner together, and I remember him telling me about working at the Chicago White Sox, which just sounded like the coolest thing ever. So I wanted to ask you, how has your, your previous stints in your career affected the content you did at McGladry? So as I said, you worked for the Chicago White Sox. You also worked for My Point and a really, uh, My Points at a really key point uh, in the, in, during the first internet boom. That's right. My points was the first online incentive consumer point system in the world. Um, and what was interesting about that experience is I really had the chance to see the behavioral change that incentives give to people online. And in this case, it was just points. You received points for going to a website or, or engaging with a client company. And if you think about that now, People want information. They want education. It's, that's their point now. That's their reason, their motivation for getting. They're trying to educate themselves through a solution or, or to discover an opportunity. So my points really helped me understand how online marketing can really motivate people to engage. And it was really on the threshold that would have been the you know, late or mid-90s that we were doing that. So it was a really interesting time. The Sox... Uh, helped me in, in regards to data. The, the Sox uh, had a database of 500,000 ticket holders, not, not season ticket holders, but ticket holders. And it helped me understand how to segment and break down certain offers to entice those singular game you know, visitors versus season ticket holders and think through how do I engage with these folks in a different way and, and, and what was interesting for the season ticket holders, we actually ended up developing a season ticket holder newsletter that went to them and we also enticed them with sweepstakes to 
to come and get to get a personal uh, visit of the whole stadium uh, from one of the coaches or one of the players. And so it was that really had a lot to do with segmentation and being more relevant in how we talk to each audience. And so it was a, it was a good experience as well. And, and to some extent, I, th I would think focusing on stars, right? I mean, the White Sox, you're marketing Frank Thomas, you're marketing whoever is there. And, and with content marketing, you really have your kind of content stars too as well, right? Who, who you're trying to raise their visibility in the industry. That, you know, especially in professional services, that you know, that's a real good point that when you're selling audit or tax expertise or business consulting expertise in regards to CRM or something, people want to know, well, well, do you really know what you say you know? And the white papers, the case studies, the podcast, the interviews, all those things are, in essence, a, a taste of that expert's expertise. And so the more content we put out there that shows our level of expertise, not just theoretical expertise, but actually doing it as well, it really helps us uh, market our services. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, I first learned about the White Sox when uh, Eric's role of the White Sox when I had dinner with him at B2B Summit last year. This year, uh, we have Lead Gen Summit 2013. We've changed B2B Summit because we realize a lot of the lead gen tactics we're talking about, like the tactics we're talking about with Eric today, are equally applicable to both B2B and B2C companies who are generating leads. That's going to be in San Francisco this year. And uh, I think one of the big benefits is not just getting to see the sessions on stage. Like I got to see Eric's session. We're talking about it here today. Learned a lot from it. But also really getting to network and meet with other top tier lead gen marketers like, like I was fortunate enough to do with Eric. So if you're interested, it's uh, in the beginning of October there in San Francisco. Beautiful location right on Union Square in San Francisco. And I'm sure the marketing team is going to send out a special discount code for you kind folks tuning into the webinar today. But let's, let's, let's tell us a little bit about McGladry. We had a question here from Eric. He's a senior manager of corporate marketing. He wanted to know if your strategy was applicable for B2B communications as well. And I think that's right up your alley with McGladry, right? Oh, for sure. There's no doubt that B2B companies, most of all, I think, have a, uh, the best way to reach out to those senior executives and business owners is through content. And, and content, though, that is not self-serving. So content that's educational, that's solving an issue you know that market segment has. And, and that's what you need to think about. You really need to put yourself in the shoes of that prospect and find content that'll help them make a decision. The earlier you can get into that discovery process or what they call self-guided discovery, using your content, the more likely you are to be somebody they want to consider and bring in on, on a bid. And uh, to do that, you have to demonstrate thought leadership, right? We have a question here from Kim. She's a senior email marketing manager. She wants to know how to develop a thought leadership culture in the workplace, so how to get people to actually want to be those thought leaders. So what we're looking at now is pretty much a graph breaking up how you focus your efforts, and we see that 60% you could have chosen to focus on anything. You could have chosen to focus on, McGladry has a big uh, golf sponsorship. Uh, you could have chosen to focus on other things, but that thought leadership seems very, very important to McGladry. Why is that, Eric, and, and how did you foster that culture? You know, it, it goes back to the idea of showcasing or, or teasing people with a sampling of our smarts, and, and the, the golf program is great, our advertising is great, but those aren't necessarily highly engaged moments. You know, you see an ad, and you get a specific short-term message to that individual, whereas content is something that you clearly can share. You can have discussions around it. It can, it can give you an idea of that company's expertise. And, and we clearly thought that was very important, and especially for professional services firms, it's nothing new. You know, throughout, for the last decades, attorneys and, and accountants have been putting out thought leadership it just now, uh, we have to think more about being more deliberate and it, having a strategy around you put together how, how you put together that content so that it really has impact for that individual and aligns to their kind of buy cycle, how they're learning um, about the solution or you know, trying to solve a pain point. But you didn't have that all lined up to begin with, right? I mean, you faced a lot of challenges to get to the point where we're at today. Uh, we have several questions about that from Dan. He's a president. He, he was firing them at you. He wanted to know, how did you come up with this? What other ideas did you try that didn't work? Why was your technique so successful? 
and what would it take for us to replicate your success? Right, a lot of good questions there. I, uh, the way I looked at it first, it was out of desperation that I kind of pulled together a lot of these different trials and errors in effort. And, and the, the, the first effort really had to go back to, I need to prove to these accountants, because they are number crunchers, they believe in numbers, and we looked at the metrics. When they produced good, high-quality content, we had increased in visitors, we could see the, 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 that people would show up. And so now it's just a process of continuing to engage those people and, and developing multiple pieces of content around that subject. So once we were able to do that with one individual, somebody who's really, somebody on our team, one of our subject matter experts who was willing to be kind of that guinea pig and show the results that they would get to everybody else, everybody else wanted in. They wanted to be part of that process and take advantage of it. And, and probably the big earmark success for us was when one particular individual in our risk and fraud space, he, his story, his white paper, and his case study they worked on, those things got picked up by reporters. And they ended up getting him on CNN, uh, CNBC and some other networks. And so it was a great showcase for us to go tell that story to the other subject matter experts. And, and, but really, it is kind of a trial and error effort. You, you have to figure out what works for your team. I think metrics are the way to start because that's what most professionals and or any individual trying to see whether their content's worthy, that you have to ha pick those key metrics and, and watch them. So speaking of metrics, I'm gonna quickly go through some marketing Sherpa research about content marketing. And then I wanna ask you, Eric, we're talking about, and is a pretty big company, but some specific advice for small companies and how they can get going in content marketing. So as we see here, some of, some of our research, what's most effective for nurturing, this is what you're telling us, almost everything towards the top of that list is content. Sales calls will be the one exception. Uh, marketers using email newsletters, white papers, we talked about thought leadership, thought leadership articles, webinars like this one, blog posts, all of that is content based. That's what they're telling us is effective for lead nurturing. But also when you look at content, you can see in this chart, the farther it goes to the right, the more effective it is. The higher it goes up, the more difficult it is. So you can see content is one of the more effective tactics, SEO being the most effective. Content, of course, is an important aspect of SEO, but it's also among the most difficult. Look at that, it's, it's very near the top. Trade shows, perhaps only the thing more difficult with all the logistics challenges that you face with trade shows, finding the right free swag to give away. But uh, content is very difficult for marketers. And yet, when we look at this chart, when we look how marketers are expected to uh, invest their future budgets, they're getting 62% of marketers are increasing their content budget. So what we know, we know that content works, but it is hard. So Eric's here to tell us it doesn't have to be. And, and, and I want to specifically talk about small companies for just a moment, because you know, I'm glad you're a pretty large company. Uh, we had a question from Michelle, she's a GM and VP. She said, with very small companies of only one or two people, it's very difficult to create good content on a consistent basis. How would you approach this dilemma? We have thought about smaller chunks of information and answering specific questions from visitors at the start. Any other, th any other things we should look at? There's a lot of things you can do, and I think there's a, a point in time where you take a look at all the things you can do as far as creating content, right? Everything from a white paper or putting on a big event, an in-person event, to just doing a simple podcast, kind of like we're doing here, and, and realize that it's, it's easier to start small and build up to it. So I'll give you a good example we are a large company, but we're made up of a lot of niche practices. And in one case, we have a retail expert, one retail expert in New York, and he produces all the content for that practice. But it's, it's really just being consistent and constant. constant. And, and what we worked out with him in the beginning was that instead of you trying to come up with a white paper or case study every month, because he kind of struggled with that, let's sit down and just interview you and we'll create a a written document from there and then we moved to, for, for the interview to become much like this interview so that it's recorded and we just part of, started putting out a podcast every month and now he has a regular subscription base of about 3,000 subscribers to his retail commentary which is a written kind of blog post type of write-up on the retail industry. And so we built up to it, and, and so he, he 
got the behavior in him as we worked on something small that he could do easily, and then he saw success there, and then he was willing to give more time. Because most of, the, most of it is that people have to get it into their behavior to want to create content, and they won't do it unless they see results. So start small, but be constant and consistent with it. So you mentioned content as a, I'm sorry, you mentioned podcasts as an effective distribution channel. We have a question from Kim here. What are your most effective content distribution channels? And uh, I'd imagine as we see on this slide, when you think about your most effective content distribution channels, it's likely not just one channel, right? I know reuse was very important to you, so it's creating content in one area and then putting it out through other channels as well, right? That's right. We, we leverage a demand generation using our marketing automation system to, to push offers out there. We have newsletters. We use social syndication where we've earmarked certain specific communities, uh, LinkedIn groups. We also train our professionals how to use LinkedIn updates and to promote the content and when it's out there and that they're pointing a link back to our content. So we, we use a lot of different distribution channels to get that content out there. And we also, as, as this slide shows, we try to build multiple assets around the same topic. So it's not just a white paper, but if, it's, if we consider this a high value topic, we're gonna try and build a podcast associated to that. Maybe we're interviewing a client in that particular podcast. We'll do press releases. We'll do a webinar on it. Each piece giving a little slight different perspective so that we really dimensionalize the topic. And, it, and, and of course, it makes you seem more, appear more credible because you've got all these different perspectives occurring. Yeah, and uh, so when we put out the um, invitation, we got this great uh, feedback from June. She's an account manager. She said, uh, just a friendly FYI, in the actual email invitation, the singular possessive should be plural possessive. The company tripled writer's productivity. We had writer apostrophe S, not writer's, ap writer's apostrophe. And I think that right there, our own mistake, uh, shows some of the real challenges that uh, you have in creating content. So let's get into how you increased writer's productivity, what your challenges were. Um, clearly, one of our challenges was uh, catching that error. <laughs> what were some of your challenges? <laughs> you know, it, the, the process involves a lot of people, uh, or in many instances, when we first started, it was myself and another person, and then we had two writers. And, and that's for a big organization. So we lacked resources as well. We had writers who were on the bench, basically waiting for somebody to, to raise their hand and say, hey, I need help writing this. And so they were taken off and, and, and put to work. And, and I kind of lose sight of them until that project was done, and then they'd come back. So uh, a big part of that is just getting transparency in, in your work effort and understanding the resources you have, what are they working on, and when are they available, and those types of things. So, so we went out and found a project management system. We started out with Excel initially, moved to Microsoft Access, and then jumped over to uh, Basecamp, which is what we use now because it's cloud-based, and we can work with freelancers and those types of things. So having that transparency is really important to understand what all your resources if you're using contractors or not but you know when things are going to start and when they're going to get done and make sure you have specific timelines and set expectations with all the people involved that subject matter expert any writer you may use or yourself setting it up for yourself you need to have your own project timeline and and make sure you stick to it otherwise you'll what you'll find is that you're scattered you're jumping to the next biggest voice that's in your ear. So Mauro specifically asks, how did you increase productivity of writers? And I think this, this workflow here really uh, kind of shows it. Can, can you walk us through this a little? Yes. So clearly, when you look at the top there of the screen, when somebody has an idea for a topic, and gee, I'd love to create some content around this topic, and, and they're not quite sure what the initial content is, it may be a white paper or something else. They submit that request. That request goes to a, and we've moved down to the diamond here, it goes into my group, and my group makes sure that a industry leader or line of business leader sees that request or that idea, and they give it the blessing. So, Because you've got to figure in a regulated industry like ours, and as big as an organization we are, a lot of times you could have people with the same idea, and if they didn't go through a a singular process like this, we might have a lot of duplicate creation. So 
It comes through the system, it gets put into our process, our project planner, and we, we start to set up an initial meeting and we walk them through, here's what, here's what the milestones are. We're gonna you know, write a rough draft, we're gonna get that approved by the, the draft is gonna get approved by the industry leader, line of business leader, then it's gonna come back to us, and, and you'll, you'll look at it as the subject matter expert, you'll approve it, those kinds of things. And so you'll go through this stepping stone process, it's very methodical, and, and we make sure it gets done. Depending on how big the project is, it could be you know, weeks or months, or it could be as quick as days. We have 30% of our projects are turnaround projects within about 48 hours. So this process that you see here may look somewhat long, and it, and it is to a degree, but when it is a hot, relevant issue occurring, like a tax regulatory change or something, we have certain parameters that we can cut through that process to uh, gain approvals quickly, we tell people this is a hot issue, and so they're waiting. They're waiting to approve something that we don't have to hunt them down and find them, and and that's understood. Again, that's setting good expectations of everybody who you you, you need support of. That subject matter expert, approvers, editors, proofers. A lot of people forget about proofing, as, as that other person mentioned in the previous slide. Is proofers are just as important as the, your creators because you want to make sure the quality is kept up to par and that you're hitting your brand guidelines and those types of things. Excellent, and we had a question here from Alan. He said, hey, can I check your thoughts about external writers, using external content writers? And I believe that's something you look at as well, right? You have your internal writers, but you determine, hey, sh does this need an internal writer or should we use an external writer? How do you, how do you determine that? We, we try to find external uh, resources when it's repeatable, meaning for a lot of our newsletters, we use an external writer or slash editor to work with the team because it's, as a contractor, we, we can only main, keep track or say game uh, the, the, the reverence with a particular contractor if we can give them steady work, right? Th that way they'll be somewhat loyal to us. So I try to pick things that are repeatable for contractors to work on, so they have kind of a steady paycheck from us, and thus I gain loyalty. It also helps them become part of the team if they're the regular person. I'm not shoving a, a whole new freelancer to, to the same group over and over. The other thing I look for is just to have, in, in regards to writers and or even graphic designers, a lot of people make requests for highly experienced individuals that are in a particular space and what I call Cadillac resources. And the reality is you, you may only really need the Chevy, and that is you need a good journalist who can ask good st uh, questions and tell a good story. And the same of other resources you might use. Because you, if you have a subject matter expert, they're the expert. They just need somebody to help pull that story out of them. And that's why you need good storytellers versus you having to get a technical writer that really knows this space. Let the subject matter expert use their expertise to, to do that and, and get a good storyteller to work with them. And, and speaking of the subject matter experts, we had a question here from Dee, a founder. I love the idea of creating energy around content for subject matter experts. I'm looking forward to learning more about this and how you did that. And I think the transparency of the results you were saying was such an important factor, right? That's right. The Getting the groups to see their, what their content does for us. So what you see here is a, a website report, you get it from Google Analytics, and you find when you kind of push that content out, if you have URL link codes such as Bitly and so forth, you can actually go back to report that, hey, your content created you know 10,000 click-throughs and visitors to our site, way to go. You know, and, and that energizes people and energizes other practice leaders to want to jump in and, and try and you know try their luck. It creates a little bit of competition. And we'll see uh, here on a regular basis in group meetings where one group will state to the other leaders, well, our tax digest is the most downloaded item on the website. You know, and, and they're saying that to the consulting lead. You know, so uh, it creates quite a bit of competition. Once you get that measurement out there and can really pinpoint it, it really energizes those uh, subject matter experts. Yeah, I love that competition you talked about at creating. That is absolutely fantastic. I, mean, I think that's all our dream, to get subject matter experts so jazzed up 
that uh, they're kind of fighting to uh, get involved in the content. Uh, so, well, unfortunately, we're at 2.30. That's all the time we have today. I want to thank, thank you, Eric, for joining us. Welcome. Thank you for having me. And thank you to everyone on the line. I hope we get to see a lot of you at, in Lee Gen Summit in San Francisco. Have a good day. Thank you.